happy to have uh, Joe Bogey simulation with a detailed astrophysical test of dark matter on sub galactic scale. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so uh, I want to give uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we can test dark matter at best on subgalactic scales, which I think are really crucial to understanding dark matter, certainly historically, where, as we all know, the evidence for dark matter really comes from galaxy rotation curves in the 1970s has really changed the field uh, towards accepting dark matter. Uh, and even these days, uh, in the absence of any non-gravitational interaction between dark matter, I think that subgalactic scales uh, are the crucial uh, scales to look at for understanding uh, maybe more about the dark matter uh, than we do now. And so I'll be in particularly focusing on kind of three different observables, uh, the radial structure of dark matter, the shape of dark matter, and the small scale structure, and see you know, how can we measure these, how are they affected by baryons, so how much should we be you know, caring about simulations uh, for these in the context of this uh, workshop, uh, and what can we learn about the fundamental uh, dark matter uh, interactions and the fundamental nature of dark matter. Uh, so I'm also be focusing on uh, what we can do in the Milky Way, uh, uh, but I should also mention that I think external galaxies already provide, you know, quite complementary constraints, and I'll talk a little bit about gravitational lensing, uh, but also in the future, I think dynamics in external galaxies, like nearby external galaxies, will become very uh, useful for these questions as well with the big surveys uh, that are uh, starting soon. Uh, so I'll first talk uh, with the radial structure, and I should say, like, if you have questions, please interrupt uh, during the talk. So, you know, I think it's supposed to be a discussion-focused workshop. We'll try to make some you know, try to keep things simple and hopefully stir some, uh, some uh, discussion here. Uh, so the radial structure of dark matter is, is very useful. Um, we know that dark matter interactions in some models form a core uh, in some alternative dark matter models, like in SIDM or in fuzzy dark matter. Um, and we can pretty straightforwardly often measure the dark matter's radial structure uh, with dynamical modeling. So for example, in low surface brightness galaxies where there's very little, uh, in, there are very few, uh, the baryons don't contribute much to the mass. So you can measure uh, just from uh, rotation curves of the gas, you can measure uh, the radial structure of the dark matter profile quite well. Um, also in some Milky Way dwarfs, uh, we can use simple, relatively simple dynamical modeling uh, to measure these. And observations have found, for example, in low surface brightness galaxies or in Milky Way dwarfs here in the bottom, uh, that there seem to be cores uh, in these galaxies. Uh, whereas in you know standard uh, dark matter only CDM, you expect there to be a cuspy profile. Um, now that is the expectation from standard CDM is that you get this uh, r to the minus one cusp in the center. Uh, but unfortunately, baryonic feedback, uh, primarily from supernovae, uh, also creates cores uh, in these galaxies. Um, and this depends very much on kind of how many stars there are. Uh, really in your, gal uh, in your galaxy. And I think there's some really nice results from simulations that have shown uh, that the inner slope, uh, so this is the slope kind of in the inner part of the galaxy, uh, where this is kind of a very cuspy profile, uh, like you would expect uh, from dark matter only simulations. Dark matter only simulations, they always give you these, uh, these open circles here, so you always get a very strong cusp. Uh, as soon as you turn on uh, hydrodynamics uh, and baryonic feedback, uh, a lot of star, a lot of galaxies where there's uh, like a kind of intermediate uh, ratio between the stellar mass and the halo mass, there's so much feedback uh, that your cusp gets completely destroyed and becomes a core. Um, now, uh, there are some places where that doesn't happen. Um, and so those are good places then actually look for the radial structure of dark matter to actually learn something about the particle physics. Uh, so one thing is that the Milky Way itself, uh, as a very big galaxy, should, be, should have a cusp, we believe, because there's nothing, uh, the, even though there's lots of supernovae going on, there's just... You know, so much else uh, that they're not enough to destroy the, the core. Um, uh, now, of course, in the Milky Way, it's quite hard to measure uh, the core uh, there. I don't think there's any real realistic measurement that anybody trusts of whether there is a core uh, or not in the Milky Way, but it's potentially something we could do. Um, and at the very low mass end, if you look at very low mass dwarfs, uh, also there's just not enough stars, there's not enough supernovae uh, to disrupt uh, the core. So that's a good place to, uh, to look as well. Uh, there, the issue is that you don't have that many stars, so it's hard to measure things do dynamical modeling that's precise enough to learn something. Uh, the other thing that you can look at perhaps is just dark subhalos as well. And that'll be a, a theme of the talk. So maybe if you should just try to look at dark subhalos directly. Um, okay, next is the halo shape. Um, so standard uh, CDM simulations where there's no baryons uh, predict uh, that dark matter halo should be very strongly triaxial. Um, and then in some dark matter models like um, Again, uh, in SIDM, for example, where you thermalize the dark matter, the inner structure of the dark matter halo, it also spherically the distribution. And so you should uh, create kind of spherical halos, whereas 
dark matter only simulations show that they should be very strongly triaxial. Uh, now here again, the baryons are annoying uh, because uh, the CDM prediction, once you actually put in baryons is that the, uh, that the inner density uh, of the halo actually becomes axisymmetric and slightly flattened. Uh, so it shouldn't be quite spherical, but it should be actually very close to spherical. And that it means that again, there's not very much of a difference uh, between that prediction and the prediction uh, that you get from models like SIDM, where you expect like a very spherical halo. If there's not too many baryons there as well, the situation there for like actually predicting the shape is also not uh, that straightforward. Um, so in terms of, you know, people have tried to measure the shape. I've tried to measure the shape uh, of, the, of, the, of the Milky Way halo. Um, and you can get, you know, pretty good precise results. Uh, I think the real problem here is that the prediction from CDM is not just that, is not, not that very precise. Like there's no, like, it has to be this. There's just a large scatter in the kind of shape that, that you expect. Um, so there should be like a shape, a flattening of something like 0.8 in the, in the axis ratio, but there's a very large scatter around this. Uh, and it's not clear to me that we can condition <laughs> on enough other variables. Like if we knew enough about the galaxy that we could reduce that scatter uh, by conditioning on other observables. So I'm not sure that the shape is actually in the end gonna teach us much uh, uh, about dark matter physics. Um, uh, current Milky Way constraints measure the shape of the inner halo to be pretty close to spherical. Um, you know, I think at least in the inner halo, we can do a pretty good job uh, to uncontroversially uh, measure the shape. Um, but it's like, this seems consistent with CDM. It's also consistent with SIDM. Uh, so it's basically consistent uh, with anything. I don't think there's, I don't know that many predictions for like low mass galaxy shapes, but there maybe there's something possible there. I don't think it's something that people have looked at uh, very much. But again, I think the shape is a very rough hammer. Um, so again, the baryons are kind of messing things up. Um, okay, the next is we can look at the substructure uh, in the dark matter halos, because again, standard CDM, very, you know, very robust prediction is that the dark matter halo should be filled with tons of substructure uh, in the form of collapsed uh, subhalos that are floating around. Uh, so we have uh, dark matter only sim simulations, uh, so there should be uh, a, about self-similar population of subhalos uh, that goes down way below uh, a solar mass uh, in total mass and has a mass spectrum that's DMDM roughly going as m to the minus two, the slight deviation uh, from that. Um, so the high mass end, we can trace this just with dwarf galaxies because they all sit in dark matter halos and that historically led uh, to the missing satellites problem. But as you know, I'm sure everybody knows and Allison was also pointing out, this is basically you know, solved by baryonic processes um, changing you know, what you expect at the very high mass end. Um, 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 so here again, baryons uh, do kind of you know, make a difference in, in what you actually predict. Uh, so dark matter halo, dark matter only uh, simulations you get you know, abundant substructure uh, everywhere. Um, the subhalo fraction, uh, there's a lot of tidal disruption that happens even in dark matter only simulations. Uh, so near the sun, really only about 0.1% of the dark matter is in substructure, uh, but it increases to like tens of percent after the viral radius. Uh, and there's this mass spectrum, uh, as I said already before. Uh, now, if you actually like have a, bar a galaxy that forms uh, in, your, in your dark matter halo, uh, it tends to increase the amount of tidal disruption uh, of dark matter subhalos, um, and so you get a suppression of the subhalo fraction near the disk. So you go even below this 0.1% uh, number uh, near the near the sun, where we can measure things uh, the best. Um, um, and then there's very little suppression of very large radii because they're the effect of the baryonic disk. It's basically just a gravitational effect increasing, you know, tidal disruption. Uh, so if you're far away from the disk, then very little happens. So you're still at high percentages of substructure in the outer disk in the outer halo, but it's very hard to measure the substructure fraction there. Um, you know, actually, the, actually predicting this in simulations is very difficult because resolution is really, really important. Um, and even, even I would argue, um, simulations like fire, which are quite high resolution to, for these kind of, uh, uh, for these kind of, you know, all physics models uh, are still not quite high enough uh, to really, uh, to really uh, resolve how a dark matter halo is, is, is disrupted because they still, at the very low mass end, they still don't really resolve them very well. Yeah, Sydney. Why is it supposed to be something that's more than a small Yeah, I think there's, like, you mean like the Van and Bosch uh, at all work? Um, I mean, yes, I think that, yeah, they make a lot of good points, I think, <laughs> about those. And we, so we've done re simulations of individual subhalos at extremely high resolution using those. You know prescriptions for the softening 
uh, to make sure that it is you know, that it is proper to like actually resolve tidal structure uh, tidal disruption. Uh, we actually find much less uh, reduction in this in the subhalo fraction uh, than than simulations like fire, where there's often claims that like almost everything is is destroyed. We only find a forty percent. Uh, reduction or so, and also that it's pretty constant with mass, so that this mass spectrum is essentially the same, um, uh, which is good news because that's something that we then can potentially measure. And if if not too many are destroyed, you can still you know measure them, and you you don't necessarily care so much about how many are destroyed. Um, okay, so in general, I think the the theme of this first part of the talk are that baryons are a problem, uh, um, and so you know we want to get away from them, um, and so. I put this up here. <laughs> this is the EHT uh, image. Put this up here, you know, not because I want to claim that we should be using EHT style observations to learn and put the dark matter, uh, but to make a point, uh, which is that you know this image is very impressive and it you know it's really you know has captured the imagination of a lot of people. Uh, but experts confirm to me that from these kind of observations, we're not actually going to learn anything about GR and we're not going to learn anything about quantum gravity because there's so much going on in the plasma physics here. That we'll learn a lot about what goes on around black holes, uh, but we're not actually going to learn about gravity from these. And I think similarly, there's a real issue in, in using galaxy observations that we're not going to learn that much about the dark matter if we're just if there's so many baryonic effects always uh, messing things up. Uh, so I think we should go away from that. And so the solution is to just study dark matter subhalos directly, starless dark matter subhalos, because then baryons, you know, it's not like they don't have any effect. But there's going to be much less effect on them if there's no baryons in the thing you're looking at. Um, so there's uh, there's things we can do. So we have you know we, there should be dark matter subhalos below 10 to the 8 solar masses or so. There should be like basically uh, no stars in these. Certainly, if you go a little bit below that, but I think you know even at this mass, uh, there's these are completely dark objects. Uh, they should be very abundant in in dark matter halos. Um, and so we have this this mass spectrum that we expect. Um, so we can try to look for this, and either they're there, um, and then that's that's good because then maybe we can study them, or they're not there, and then they point to new physics. Uh, so just looking at their abundance uh, is very useful, um, and if they're abundant, we can maybe look into their internal structure, um, which should be much less influenced uh, by uh, by, bar uh, by baryonic effects. Um, okay, so to do that, there's two main uh, methods that exist uh, to look at dark matter subhalos directly. One is tidal streams in galaxies, you know, primarily currently in the Milky Way, but in the future, uh, perhaps in, uh, in external galaxies as well. So these are uh, very thin streams of stars that form from the tidal disruption of a, of a star cluster uh, orbiting around in a galaxy like the Milky Way. Uh, the other is that we can use gravitational lensing uh, uh, to look at the mass distribution uh, between uh, us and a lens. I'm gonna skip this. And we have lots of streams in the Milky Way. Here's the field of streams, very famous picture. Uh, we have good observations of gravitational uh, lenses, uh, lots of these quad images uh, where you can measure uh, the ratios uh, of the fluxes uh, in these different images to, to figure out uh, what's going on with the magnification uh, there and how it's affected uh, by dark matter structure. Um, so both of these uh, are affected by little uh, subhalos. Uh, so streams, as they're orbiting in the galaxy, they interact with dark matter subhalos, and when they interact, uh, they get little little disturbances uh, to them as so you start kind of creating this pattern of kinks uh, in streams. Uh, so the density becomes non-uniform. Uh, the, 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 the whole track gets a little bit kinky. Uh, I guess that's a weird way to say it, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, and so by like looking at the tracks of these streams, we can like look, you know, can directly gravitationally image, um, in some sense, uh, dark matter uh, streams. Uh, sorry, dark matter subhalos. Um, and then sub, uh, subhalos, the effect on, 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 on gravitational lenses is that if you're very close, if your image uh, that you form happens to be very close to a subhalo, uh, then there's a very strong increase in the relative magnification. And so one of these images um, in, these, uh, in these quads will have like an anomalous magnification. And so these are called flux ratio anomalies, uh, which you see very commonly. Um, and so they're indicative of perhaps being very close uh, to a dark matter subhalo. And so they, again, they can show you directly a dark matter subhalo, even if there's no stars. Um, and so both of them are basically depending on the second derivative of the gravitational potential, uh, because they're kind of tidal effects. You know, like the magnification depends directly on the second derivative. The potential, these are tidal effects in some sense. So they directly, uh, they also depend on the second derivative of the gravitational potential. And so they, 
that's directly related to the density. Uh, so you directly see the densities of these objects. Um, so we can use this uh, to do things like measure the dark matter subhalo abundance directly, um, uh, just using you know, the gravitational uh, interaction between you know, dark matter subhalos and streams or the effect of dark matter subhalos uh, on, on these flux ratio anomalies. Uh, and this now allows us uh, to measure uh, the dark matter subhalo mass function down to about 10 to the seven solar masses. Uh, both this is in the Milky Way from our work on streams. Uh, this is using uh, gravitational lensing flux ratio anomalies uh, from Daniel Gilman, uh, Tomasa Troy, and such as uh, work um, there. And so you see, they're basically kind of you know, very similar in that they go down to like about 10 to the seven where they can measure uh, the dark matter subhalo mass function. And it's all consistent uh, with CDM, uh, what we find now. Uh, so this allows you to do things like constrain warm dark matter models, for example. So I'm just using uh, our Milky Way measurements here. So you can look at you know, what you expect for just a thermal relic uh, warm dark matter model. Um, and so you can put some constraints on that. And so you get very strong uh, constraints uh, on these models, especially if you combine all of them because they're consistent. Uh, so you can basically kind of rule out warm dark matter doing anything interesting uh, at this point. Um, OK, so the final few minutes of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, what, how we can actually measure the radial structure, perhaps, uh, of, dark, of dark matter subhalos directly. Um, and so the context here will be in the context of the SIDM model, where you expect uh, the radial structure uh, to, be, to be different from the CDM substructure, uh, because uh, the interactions in SIDM, as has already been discussed, uh, tend to first thermalize the halo and form a core. Uh, but then as heat transfer uh, continues, they can also lead to core collapse and you can get very, very cuspy, uh, cuspy dark matter halos. Uh, so there's this kind of wide variety of things that can happen. This can explain things like the diversity of rotation curves. Um, so it's, a, you know, it's kind of a useful model uh, to look at. But mostly I'm going to just use it also to make the point that we can just measure the inner structure of dark matter subhalos directly. Um, so so we, I'll talk about uh, SIDM. Um, so what's the effect of like changing the radial structure of a subhalo on these two, uh, these two main probes uh, that we've been looking at? As uh, so for streams, you know, if you have something like SIDM, it doesn't matter that much for the general pattern of these kind of kinks that you form in the stream, because most of the interactions between a stream and a subhalo are a pretty large impact parameter. So that like exactly what's going on in your halo doesn't matter because you're just so far away from it. Um, but there could be close interactions. And so if you, if you happen to have a very close interaction between a subhalo um, and, a, and a stream, then you could get a very, then you could be very sensitive to the inner structure. Um, uh, so it's kind of like, you know, in general, the whole structure of the stream will be not that affected, but you might get lucky sometimes. And, you know, we expect there sometimes to be a, a close to direct hit uh, there. And so in that case, you might see like a very strong perturbation if you have a core collapsed halo that has a very cuspy structure. Uh, so this may be happening in the Milky Way. We see kind of strong kinks in some of the streams uh, in the Milky Way. Um, so that's certainly something I think that requires uh, more investigation. Uh, for gravitational lensing, the flux ratio anomalies are actually very sensitive to exactly what's going on in the center. So it's not like you, you pass pretty close uh, to the center of a subhalo. So they're much more uh, in general sensitive to the inner structure um, of, a, um, of, a, of, the, of, the, of the object uh, that is causing the additional lensing um, that you're seeing there. So they're very, they're very um, so strong lensing, gravitational lensing is much more uh, sensitive to this. Um, and so we did some simulations uh, with Daniel Gilman, uh, again, who was a postdoc here until last year or so, and as in Chicago, um, of like what you expect uh, in terms of gravitational lensing signatures uh, in these models. And CDM in general, um, the halos, the subhalos are low density enough that they don't really uh, strongly change like the critical curve. So you just get like pretty, you get minor changes to the magnification and they're observable, uh, but they're not like enormous. Uh, whereas in SIDM models, if there's no core collapse and you just form, form uh, cores themselves, and again, it's very similar to what you expect uh, in CDM. But if you have core collapse halos that a radial structure is strongly uh, different, then you start like having like very strong effects on the critical curve. And so very strong uh, lensing effects there. Uh, and so you could potentially see this. Uh, so there are SIDM halos, uh, collapsed halos, uh, give you much stronger magnifications by a factor of a few. Um, and so we looked at this, I don't want to talk about too much uh, in detail, but like in various SIDM models, you can get very interesting phenomenology, even for a simple Yukawa force, depending on the, uh, depending on the, uh, on the parameters of your force and how this all plays out as a function of velocity. 
Uh, so we played around with some of these models just to see kind of what happens. Uh, and so for example, so we picked a, a bunch of kind of models where you have, you know, sometimes like resonances or not uh, in the, in the cross section. Um, and so what this does to your gravitational lensing signal. And so here's CDM. So again, you know, nothing much is happening. And then in these SIDM models, you can get very strong, uh, very strong effects uh, on the lensing. Uh, here's a bunch more. So typically, you know, really strongly perturbed the critical curve and so you can get very strong uh, deviations uh, from what you expect. Um, uh, now it's the simulations for all of this in terms of what we expect are you know, not that mature, I would say. So we don't really know when, uh, how much to expect core collapse to happen in these subhalos because it all depends uh, um, like exactly on the, the orbit of the stream and people haven't done too many uh, simulations of these kind of models. Uh, so we try to kind of parameterize all of this uh, with a few parameters, uh, one being, uh, so we have you know, how like some, some parameter that kind of tells you how fast in general halos uh, core collapse. Um, and then another parameter that tells us how fast sub halos core collapse um, in, in relation uh, to field halos. Um, uh, because this might be different because like tidal effects and such might, might change how, how, how quickly core collapse uh, happens in these, in these halos. And then using just 11 observed, uh, 11 observed systems, uh, you, can constrain the, the, you can constrain models in this space and, and basically show that everything's consistent with CDM and you rule out things where a lot of things core collapse. So we can rule out that, that most halos and most sub halos um, are core collapse so that their radial structure is very different uh, from CDM uh, in that case. Um, so, you know, so this, you can put your SIDM models basically on this, although I think to, to really interpret them, you'd have to run more simulations of your SIDM uh, model, but we can basically rule out uh, that all halos core collapse. Um, Okay, um, so in the future, I think we'll get a lot more uh, data. We'll get more streams uh, from things like the Rubin telescope, which would allow us to look at uh, streams. Uh, this is a you know example stream, like kind of the top is what we have right now. LSSD, the Rubin, one year will give us much better maps. Ten year maps will be even better. Roman will do like even better than that for streams in the Milky Way, also for streams in external galaxies. Um, and on gravitational lensing, uh, there will be like more lenses. Will be found by large uh, by large surveys like Euclid, uh, and then if you follow them up with JWST, you can actually get uh, you can get uh, smaller uh, source sizes uh, that are still not affected by microlensing, so that you can get uh, better uh, constraints. Uh, you can get even closer in uh, to the centers of halos to be able to like uh, rule out things like you know these uh, SIDM models uh, by a factor of two better or so. And so so kind of in general, kind of constrain the radial structure. Uh, better than we do uh, these days. Um, um, okay, so I'll, I'll stop here just by concluding that, you know, I think, you know, looking at these kind of observations of radial structure um, and substructure abundance, you know, I think they're very useful for constraining dark matter models, but the baryonic effects are very severe. Um, and, you know, my pessimistic view is that if baryons are, are involved, you know, too much, that there's really little we're going to learn. Um, and so that's why I think, you know, the best thing to do in the future is to like gravitationally study dark objects directly. And so I think that we should put like resources into the simulating uh, into those to like figure out you know, exactly what to expect uh, for these dark and uh, these dark objects. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you.